We don't care about the clown when the makeup is on. We don't care about the clown when the makeup is off. We care about how much they can make us laugh and make us forget that they too want someone to laugh at as opposed to being something to laugh at. Make satirizing their surfing crew more justified. <laughs> I don't know, I kinda wanna blame Ray J for all of this. Dr. Uma may have had a point with this whole anti-interracial rhetoric. It only takes a little bit of white brainwash to activate the <laughs> shit in the average Negro. I find much value in role-playing games because they often give you a dose of knowledge you wouldn't have been able to obtain elsewhere. In a game I often frequent, the protagonist said, to influence the actions of others through strength of character, charisma, talent, and ingenuity means you are inseparable from your power. Even if you go, your wisdom transcends. To influence by means of convenience, conditional efforts, is similar to those whose power fall into money, and therefore, such influence is contingent on the quality of something that can easily be broken, transferred, discarded, or forgotten. I'm not that far into this game yet, despite the fact I've been playing it every single day, but the protagonist who made that up really put into perspective just how we've viewed certain individuals of social power nowadays. In an age where you can have almost anything and everything, platforming the avenues to acquire public attention and even fame is very easy. Very easy and often very planned. In the few videos I've done, I often talk about the representation of idols and certain figures we look to for guidance and entertainment as opposed to just assigning the person to one or the other. It seems we've combined entertainment for guidance as they appeal to our substantia nigra and in these present times, it's a lot more easy to find solace in entertainment as opposed to leadership because the latter involves sacrifices a majority of us aren't willing to commit because we're born into a social, political, and economical state of privilege when compared to those that are far less fortunate. I mentioned the importance of relative intersectionality because the many terms and titles we've adapted to in the new era of fame, status, and stardom have now created new meanings within their classifications. When these things are being discussed, these words have different meanings to different people and different places. For example, when we discuss the matter of influence, what do we mean? The ability to bring about some form of action upon any desired target. A gallant effort to protest against corrupt and evil society will influence radical change upon society for the betterment of an inclusive collective. Companies discounting their once expensive products will influence a consumer to purchase their product because it's not within their budget. Despite these two examples having drastically different causes and effects, they parallel the concept that an action has been influenced. This is to say that the ability to influence is neither inherently good or inherently bad, it's just powerful. However, when we look at the grander purpose of these actions in a strong collective sense of rational benefits, the measurement of good and bad becomes a lot more blurred, just like these titles. And within these titles, I like to pose a question I want y'all to think about, which I will answer at the end of this video. In this sphere, what is talent and how do you separate the talented from the talentless. Content creators, influencers, consultants, these titles and qualities within them are becoming harder and harder to get a grasp onto given the constant flux of changes we experience in this digital and social landscape. What would constitute a content creator 10 years ago is drastically different to what would constitute one today. What would qualify as an influencer 10 years ago also has its differences. Now, obviously both these terms, while more popular in use, actually predate the age of social media, but it was only until recently you could actually be paid in a contract the positions for such roles to the degree we see nowadays. Content creation is no new concept as it really is just the production, promotion, and sharing of media content. Cartoonists, comic book artists, then MySpace video bloggers, they were all content creators before it really made a much more popularized and prominent term in the society we see now today. Since it wasn't a popularized term up until these last several few years, there hasn't been much press in regards to its use, what defines one, and overall polarization. But we've now entered a phase where people who just post stream clips onto their YouTube channel with a minimal editing to rack up even more views are being considered as content creators. But being grouped into a category has sparked the debate as to what exactly a content creator is now. The same way influencers have now come into question as to who they are, their primary focus, and the people I'm going to be talking about predominantly in this video. You see, the current use of this word and the utilization companies are going about leveraging these influences for their interests are both slimy and gross on both ends. On the influencer side, because they are aware of the power they hold among the masses and how many of them are often either A, shitty business practitioners, B, 
Cattle's being fed to a slaughter or C, sales people with clout. Many of these influences lack business and financial literacy, specifically forecasting longitudinal studies on products and market analysis. They'll kickstart any type of product based on the strength of who is behind the product as opposed to what the product is and its rational benefit. Now, of course, we don't expect these influences to be business or acom majors. They've got people on payroll or outsourced consultancy for that. But even they care far less about brand image and more about profit margins. Now, while they may not be influencers in the sense I'm describing, those being those who are known predominantly for buying, selling, and promoting, let's look at Logan Paul and KSI and their Prime brand as an example. As most of you may know, Prime Hydration Drink is, as the title suggests, an energy drink to substitute other competitors such as Gatorade, Lucasade, Powerade, and all those other energy beverages. Outside of the fact it was created by two of the biggest YouTubers in the world, they also got heavy sponsorships in the likes of UFC, the LA Dodgers, FC Barcelona, and with this being the biggest sponsorship deal in their history, the WWE. And not only is it the largest sponsorship deal in the history of the WWE, but Prime Drink are the official hydration drink partner of the WWE. Needless to say, over the course of two years, this has made them a little bit of money, you know what I mean? Not grand, just $1.2 billion, you know, some small, some light. Pocket change compared to the king of the anti-dimension, of course. On paper, you'd think, oh boy, what swell business partners making a whole lot of money. Good for them. Uh, nah. Let's look a little bit deeper. Because not only is Prime just another energy drink, no matter what they say it contains and what it does for you, it has recently been hit with a class action lawsuit because it's being accused of containing forever chemicals. If you don't know what forever chemicals are, just know excessive and high usage of it can cause harm to the body where it can reduce the immune system response time, cause reproductive harm, and a whole lot of other shit. However, like I said, this is only an accusation which is still being investigated and Logan Paul has addressed these allegations publicly, claiming that there is zero evidence against him and other people have corroborated his story that such claims do not hold up. Unfortunately, as he would say in his video addressing this, all it takes is one loud voice to tell a narrative and all news outlets will spread like wildfire, which makes it hard to contain and deal with. Naturally, one bad voice is all it takes to ruin a brand. I understand his severity with this. Either way, that's not specifically why I'm putting these f into Dux's crosshairs. On Instagram, out of their millions of followers, half of their fan base are between the ages of what, 18 to 24 for both. For KSI, a vast majority of his fans are men and sports dominate just under 30% of their interest when it comes to following him. For Logan Paul, around 60% are male and 20% of his total followers have an interest in sports and 22% have an interest in food and drink and restaurant. This means they have the perfect impressionable audience to funnel these followers into sales. And if you look at their Instagrams, it is all these niggas talk about. This is because both are practicing a common marketing tool which is known as the mere exposure effect, which is people who have a proclivity towards something they see and mass consistently and therefore, even if the exposure is transient or fleeting, they will have a good understanding and repertoire of what that product is. Because you see Prime associated with the NBA, UFC, WWE and various other celebrities, influencers and other big sponsorships, you will naturally look at Prime as a very reputable source of a product and therefore, you'll be more, way more inclined to invest into that product. Logan Paul was at WrestleMania and had I Show Speed walking down the pathway with him dressed up as a prime bottle. I don't think y'all understand the magnitude of that to have a drink that has only been in the game for about two years reach the most spectated stage in WWE history. All eyes are on everything at WrestleMania. So when you have Randy Orton hit an I Show Speed who is dressed up in a prime bottle with an RKO, you can expect the interest of this brand to spike exponentially. Prime bottles will be placed in the hands of teenagers and young adults alike everywhere after seeing it placed in their favorite platforms and events. And if your consumer base consists of the demographic whose opinions are easily swayed and their allegiance is grounded in popularity and entertainment, rest assured you'll be making a hefty bag from it until some scandal big enough force you out of the public eye. Which, given these two, is unlikely. Because these two at this point can literally, and I really do mean literally, do no wrong anymore, be it publicizing your awful relationships with your co-host or scamming people out of their money via Bitcoin, or a constant creator and social media influencer's favorite, being racist, 
this immunity to scrutiny or should i say ability to not stay dead no matter what they do the market is heavily geared towards those that don't care about long term studies within the social or economical climate they'll have no objections in these practices for fuck's sake this nigga deadass assisted in orchestrating some shit bitcoin game going public after creating hype from it only to abandon it raking all the money pull out some shit defense and he still remains on top let only politicians civil figures or hell another social media influencer let's popular than them do this and you'll be so quick to get them the fuck out of here but these are titans to the exception so i like to ask y'all why do you guys think that metric changes so much and so specifically when certain people commit such things under certain circumstances compared to others because needless to say whatever we think on the corporate side with influencers and influential marketing they can give less of a shit they don't care what ksi and logan paul are selling as long as it sells you see Prime advertised everywhere. Because from one brother to the next, if Jake Paul somehow got a fight with Mike Tyson, it's gonna boost views, increase revenue for the networks that host the fight, and further embarrass the sport of boxing. Imagine being a boxer who has sacrificed blood, sweat, and tears and trying to make a name for yourself in this once respected sport, and this YouTuber has seemingly been gifted the fight with the retired fighters in Anderson Silva, professional fighters in Nate Diaz and Tyron Ridley, and of course, we can't forget about the undisputed legendary god of the mall, Nate Robinson. The point being that these individuals are being rewarded for, more often than not, not for the merit of who they are, but what they can do and how much money and attention they can bring on a large scale. How many people consistently were tuning into the boxing matches on a regular basis with the names of someone like Anthony Joshua? Unless you're someone like Anthony Joshua or Tyson Fury, you're not reaching major headlines. So, boxing is going down the drain in popularity, and then you gotta figure out how to save it. Hey, uh... You know KSI and Joe Willett, right? Oh! Man, two big British YouTubers. They got some beef going on right now. Let's have them run the 10. Hey? Nah, for real. Run the 10. Folk tuned in anyway. <laughs> Imagine if you put them into a ring with each other and made them throw hands. Like, <laughs> dog, Cancun. The wives won't be able to say shit. Oi, oi. Oi, oi, yeah, that's a shout, yeah. Oi, oh, no, 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 wait, wait, no, 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 no. What? Who's that guy that's in the flames right now? For what he did up in Japan? Um, Logan Paul. Nigga, how the fuck you know about Logan Paul? But you don't know about man. What a man, That's that's the point. Let's build a little something, something between them two. Have KSI call him out. Mad personal. Have KSI fight Logan and his brother Deji fight Jake. What the fuck did the brothers go do with this? Man, not a damn thing. You got the two hated brothers of America find the two top black YouTubers of the UK. Then. We have the fight between KSI and Logan Paul go down to a draw. Now we gotta do a rematch. Let's get some more influences onto the card and really promote the shit out of this John. Then regardless of who wins, eventually the beef will die down between Logan and KSI, but keep edging on KSI and Jake Paul. Then, let's have them be partners and drop a motherfucking energy drink of you niggas. Fucking hell, mate. Fuck, fucking hell. Fuck, fucking hell, mate. This is the fucking dog's boss, mate. Fucking fuck me sideways. Fuck, fuck. Fucking show me the money! Wait, 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 wait. I've got a fucking brain booster. You mean a brain booster? Since we fucking know the fucking kids love KSI and Logan Paul and shit, let's fucking put a limited supply on them and in the stores. Then watch them fall off the fucking shelves and make them fucking turn to Doom Slayers. <laughs> you mean, wait, Doom Slayer? You play video games? Only FIFA. Oh, what? <laughs> 2K. <laughs> nice. The best way to increase fucking brand awareness and desire is to have less of it. Fucking simple artificial scare stains apply and demand tactics. But kids are fucking kids, prime is fucking prime. We push out so much desperation for it, they'll resell them at a higher cost. Fucking massive quid, mate. But how do we make money from that if they resell? Because it fucking stirs more controversy, duh! They'll soon ban these drinks in schools to where it makes it look like we need to force more development. And by forcing development, we up the fucking cost and charge it at a higher ad spend and investors have to go ahead and invest in more. Since these are known from the fucking boxing feud, sports is the market. Then we get the clubs involved and other sporting entities and it'll grow from there. We spend less on ads but more on sponsorships and soon, when fucking Gatorade is a fucking depreciating asset, we fucking buy him out of some fucking godfather shit. <laughs> oh, yo. I like that. I like that for real. Hey, nigga, you cooking. <laughs> what do you think of Tottenham? What? Shit! Now, I'm pretty sure, more or less, that's probably how these things go down. 
Influencer marketing is one of the most profitable forms of marketing for companies, big or small, because people are significantly more likely to buy through recommendations of a trusted brand as opposed to traditional marketing. As a study back in 2012 that surveyed more than 28,000 people reported that 92% of its respondents stated to trust sources from friends and family as opposed to other forms of marketing. Now, while these influencers are not your friends and definitely not your family, you, for some reason, trust the word as bond. You will literally do anything they say, just like a Kylie Jenner. While nepotism and with the help of the BBC got her to where she is, she is one of the biggest brands on the internet and the strength of her has propelled her company Kylie Cosmetics, which in less than 10 years is worth over $1.2 billion. Wherever she goes, her 400 million followers on IG will go. And while a mega influencer like Kylie Jenner has the leverage to charge up millions of dollars for promoting certain products, that is a surefire way to increase brand awareness and generate sales. Now, if Solo Stove's Smokeless Fire Pits campaign using Snoop Dogg shows us anything, is that blind marketing with no strategy does not work. If you know what I'm talking about, Solo Stove is a company known for selling fire pits, and in November of 2023, they somehow managed to get Snoop Dogg to run a publicity stunt to where he was going to stop smoking. This naturally got a lot of people talking, and many were even going to go as far as to stop smoking weed because Snoop was going to stop smoking weed. That's how much power these people have. It was later revealed that it was part of a campaign for a smokeless fire pit. Now, to the surprise of no one, it flopped to the point where the CEO was actually replaced. This is what happens when you don't understand the market of the agent you're using to market an already niche product. Because how many people who follow Snoop are in need of a fire pit? At least enough to the point where you can go ahead and break even for the company. But Snoop Dogg isn't even an influencer in that sense, but he does what so many other socialites do. Leverage their brand to move the masses. But there's a trend between Solo Stove and the influencer boxing and Prime. They all depend on the great entity to increase their brand. Naturally, that's what influencer marketing is all about. But what about when brands do it out of exploitative and or predatory means? Y'all remember back in February at Omelay's concert, Omelay pulled up some girl from the crowd and the two of them did the nastiness on stage. We all care about this because that woman had a boyfriend, well now ex-boyfriend, who had to stand there and take that L. Cameras were on him, he was being clowned, he gained sympathy, it was really... It was really weird and once again put black people in another negative light, but I don't know if I get into that because it's a whole other conversation. Anyway, the aftermath of that was people fabricating stories that they were in a seven year relationship or they were engaged and various tales, but the woman caught a whole lot of flack. Whether or not it was deserved or not isn't really the point, but do you know what happened to the now ex-boyfriend? Shortly after that, his Instagram grew from 1,000 followers to over 83,000 followers, and his TikTok went from 2,000 followers to over 300,000 followers. Yo, quick post edit tidbit. Whilst I was recording this, when I first saw his socials, his IG was at 83,000 followers, now it's at 82,000 followers, and his TikTok was actually at 312,000 followers, but now it's at 310,000 followers. Now, Keep this in mind because this is important to what I'm about to say in a minute. Let me say that again. Over 300,000 followers. And guess who put him on stream to have a whole bunch of ladies queue up for him? Kaisenat. This is why not all niggas should have easy access to both power, influence, and money. Because not only did the guy who I will refer to as ISO, not only did ISO get all these free press and attention and passes and brand recognition, he was also off to work with such brands, and for some reason, Kaisenat gave this man 20k. Forget the 20v1 bullshit, Kai gave this man 20k. Why? Why would you do that? See, ironically, it's not actually about the money, he could have given him 5k and it wouldn't have made a difference to what I'm about to say, which is no hate to ISO at all, but what does he do? What has he done? What type of creative, cultural, intellectual, or social benefit does he provide? Not even a benefit, but a general individual showcase of the aforementioned. While my current focus isn't on Kai, as that will be safe for another video, he plays a part in this narrative of brands rewarding something for nothing. When you do this, you send a message which encourages further promotion that someone who has never showcased any talent, intellect, creative skill, or any meritable or marketable grace can be rewarded just for the exposure and just to capitalize brand awareness. Which is all Kai Sinat is, in truth, or at the very least, the bulk of what he is. He is a popular, rich, groupie chaser because he initially wanted the ex-girlfriend on stream, but she turned him down because she wanted compensation. 
Kai Sinat doesn't give a fuck about either one of them. He's just fully aware of the traffic that will come with it. Smart move, but just because something is smart, it does mean it has to be respected because there's nothing respectable about this. Why? Your girl lied to a singer about having a man, danced on him in an explicit manner, and showed this was to no remorse about it until afterwards. But you got rewarded. And what he gained was not organic followers or traffic. It's just paid, but not with money, but with the attention and fleeting convenience. He doesn't have a brand or has built any type of loyalty to who he is or what he does. Because of this, the association people will have with you is exclusively linked to the event in which you came from and nothing else. Hence why in the comments they are largely related to the topic as to where he is the byproduct of an event. Then, gifting 20k to a young man who has never seen that much money before in his life is an overwhelmingly addition to ensure that you do not fail this opportunity to yourself. Unfortunately, many in stronger positions than him have failed. Since then, ISO has made 4 TikToks. One, he was promoting some song but it cuts off after 10 seconds and for a minute it's just silent. The other is some ad-like content of him eating some fries, promoting Rio, AirPod Maxes, and Morley's. And the last one is him at a gas station doing... What is he doing here? But this looks like the beginnings of a talentless social media influencer creator because he explicitly hasn't done nothing to leverage this. Now, I'm not saying he is talentless. I'm not saying he won't contribute to anything. But he was able to assemble an audience and platform from the conditions of something extremely negative and outside of his control as opposed to something that was from his own power and force. And since he had a non-existent platform beforehand, he has absolutely nothing to showcase outside of him being a regular degla- this is the equivalent of winning the lottery. To other brands such as Kai Sinat, he's just another tool to leverage popularity and relevance. To marketers, he's another asset to use. But to everyone else, he's merely a pawn. Not even for the grand scheme of things, but a monthly checklist of people to exploit. You can see, what, the three months after he has done this, nothing much has happened for him. His socials are quiet, his YouTube is quiet, and the comment section is only as relevant to the scandal still. He hasn't displayed anything that is laudable, which ties back to the quote in the beginning. Power leveraged from convenience and the opportunity of material fortune as opposed to the opportunity of an internal source of power. In this case, talent and skill. It will become very easy to see what was once perceived as a solid and concrete to be identified as intangible and transparent. In other words, formless and easily seen through. Sir ISO is the byproduct of a negative opportunity which he, at current, seems to be unequipped to truly capitalize on unless he's scheming something big behind the scenes. That or he just realized that the social media space isn't really for him. But when we look at the probability of those that have made any long term success from such actions, it can initially appear to be unlikely. Just like Will Vicky, for example. Remember her? The white girl that claimed to be 25% black, dropped the hard ER a lot, and got on some weird beef with Bad Barbie, and had some association with Lil Tay, another little girl that y'all made famous who was also under 18. Y'all know seeing the pattern here with these ages and what happens to them after they get pushed into the limelight, right? Whoa, well, Vicky has fallen from the face of the earth despite having over a million subscribers on YouTube with little engagement, an Instagram that sends you to a profile that isn't hers, a Twitter account where her description literally says social media influencer, good god, and uh, what is this, some off-brand OnlyFans? And surprise surprise, she has some skincare brand which is, I mean do I need to say it, it doesn't appear to be very profitable. Needless to say, you'll build them up just to watch them fizzle up or crash and burn. Of course, not all influencers follow the same path as the aforementioned, and in truth, it's like how I said in my first video, just because you can do something, it doesn't mean you should. The reason why I find a problem in this field of influencers is that whilst they influence both compulsive and impulsive spending habits that will blind the mass into thinking that this is an actual profession. In truth, I see them no differently than high value salespeople. These micro and macro influencers aren't to be confused with actual ambassadors, those who have a stake in the company affairs and interest in the greater economic scope of that entity, but those who have just allowed their selling power and platform to get to their head and be praised for pretentious and flamboyant displays of their wealth. Because of this, what would be perceived as both inexpensive and unique for many is normal and affordable, air quotes, for them. Playing tennis? <laughs> Typical Nike tennis shoes? Nah, Balenciaga. Lounging around in the crib all day? Literally anything inexpensive? Nah. Balenciaga. Fucking snowboarding? Regular snowboarding gear? Nah. Dio. Seriously, what the f- Ignoring the fact that many of these micro or macro influences both either finance or loan their apparel from these designer brands, the ostentatious display is overbearingly pretentious. 
However, because TikTok has become the number one hub for micro and macro influencers alike, and posts from these influencers will outperform posts on the brand pages themselves, said brands care little to nothing about how this affects the economical culture of phenomena such as fast fashion and peacocking. The sales funnel will always have the influencers breaking more bread than they can make, and the common society spending three months rent just for a bag that they'll get 100 likes on on Instagram. You see, marketers and brands that use TikTok for their marketing may face a big problem if it gets banned in the States. Because Americans are the leading figures in trend and fashion culture, if that avenue is no longer accessible, then you need to greatly reevaluate your content and marketing strategy. As 42% of marketers use TikTok already and have planned to invest way more capital into their marketing strategies for this year. Now, for the influences that exist predominantly on that app, if that goes, so does a whole lot of money you invested. I look into establishing yourselves onto TikTok's competitors right now. I mean, this may not be a prime competitor, but Threads is actually a slow riser and you may find value if you innovate a marketing tactic there so other people can follow. Credit or not, other companies will acknowledge that and they will increase the follower and activity base and rate which will validate your ad spend. But that's just a predictive analysis. Since we know influencer marketing has existed way before the days of social media, for example, Coca-Cola using Santa Claus in 1931 to promote and market their product because of the emotional connection consumers have with Santa Claus, we understand that the methods of approach in order to tap into the consumer's behavior habits are strategically formulated as shown with ISO in prior examples. I'd be remiss to talk about influences and not talk about one of the biggest ones since when did that video drop? Kim Kardashian, as per the rest of the Kardashians, are usually placed under the scope for having their worth and talents questioned, with the big one being, what do they do? Simple. They do what other influencers do, but on a much bigger scale. You could call them the goddesses of influencer marketing of the modern age. Balenciaga could post one of their latest products, but will receive a fraction of the likes Kim Kardashian has, or will potentially get because she's Kim Kardashian. And speaking of Kim and Balenciaga, this is why we need to abandon the cattle mindset. Because when Balenciaga were under fire for that ad scandal of including children in one of their campaigns that was littered with bondage and BDSM products, Kim decided she needed to reevaluate her position within the company. Not cut ties with them, I just to think and then two years later, emerge as their new brand ambassador. See, now you really shouldn't count on these celebrities for shit. They do not care as long as it does not get in the way of their image or their money. Ethics? <laughs> That's just a five letter word to them. While we need to understand the multifaceted layering of this cogent of social media celebrity status, we also need to understand that this is just further promotion of the excessive materialistic lifestyle which seeks to both isolate the minority from the majority, as well as have the majority seek to imitate that lavish and illustrious lifestyle, presenting themselves in a manner of success and surplus for the gratification of the masses they are no different from. They will never miss an opportunity to flaunt the products of greed and surplus yet believe their humility or humble bragging and superficial displays of utilitarianism make them free from the criticisms of just being another marketing agent and salesperson for corporations that look at you no different from an employed intern they throw into the wild to influence compulsive spending habits. Hey guys, so I couldn't wait literally five minutes to drive home in my Mercedes car. That's a car, that's a Mercedes. Can you see the Mercedes logo? I'm driving a Mercedes, vroom vroom. So I want to show you my new Chanel, that's Chanel with one N for you broke bitches. New Chanel glasses, not just a bag, not no, no Chanel bag, just glasses. I couldn't wait home to show you these glasses. As you can see, and you'll see why I can't wait to show you these glasses because they're so magnificent. Magnificent. As you can see the interior of my Mercedes, I could have easily waited to go home. But here is the Chanel box with the Chanel paper and here they are. <gasps> Just so cute. These regular, regular, regular glasses that I couldn't wait five minutes to show you because, you know, you need to see the Mercedes. Um, look at the logo on the side. Two C's, a <laughs> crip. Now, I could have waited to show Oh, by the way, um, this is my um, hmm, mature influencer voice that I use to uh, help attract many masses of people. Um, there's a subtle tone of 401k and you're a broke ass bitch in this shit. Um, Gucci, Gucci, Fendi, Fendi, Prada, you niggas are broke, you have nada. <laughs> Yo, this sounds like top tier hating, but I don't care. And these influencers don't believe in hiding their luxury. Any attachment to them that comes from what they show as opposed to who they are can really invoke a psychological insight into covert traits of desiring validation, social status, and a general boost in one's ego. They cannot influence your mind, spirit, or soul, but will confuse your desire to appreciate what they have as infatuation as to who they are, and for them, that's enough. 
And while those that make those, this is what a thousand dollars gets you at XYZ, our reaction is to critique the necessity of it and then go, haha, so expensive, I'd never go down there, so dumb. On one side, the people in those videos are more than likely getting paid to promote the facility because it will lead to awareness, and through that awareness, it activates a signal to endorse other people to make such videos of similar fashions. So now you have 12 other people going, this is what $1,000 gets you at X, Y, and Z, although X, Y, and Z have easily made $12,000. It's like I have Soho House, the wannabe location for all rising and established social media influences and influences in general, and there's people of general status and class that will pay an arm and a leg for a membership to purchase exclusive rights just to say, I can afford to go here and you can. And as someone who's been to Soho House a few times, I can tell you it's nothing amazing. It's low key a bunch of nobodies pretending to be somebodies, it's very pretentious and the drinks are okay. But it serves as a beacon of the lifestyle socialites have to promote in order to find their place in the world. Which is what people buy into, the psychology of the exclusive rights, to separate yourself from everyone else. That's what they're paying for. The illusion of difference. With all this being said, in the beginning of the video, I asked what is talent in this space and how do you separate the talented from the talentless. And throughout the video, it served as the overarching theme. The ability to draw attention from a crowd is not particularly a hard skill. Simply jump on top of a table in public and start screaming really loudly and you got yourself 5 seconds of fame. However, the ability to maintain that audience and remain relevant, whether we like it or not, especially in this fleeting age of attention, is something that is particularly difficult. It doesn't make it praiseworthy, but it does display the ability to understand the market. However, and this may come across as conceited, I don't find a vast majority of these influencers in this space talented. In fact, I find both social and economic destruction in what they do and what they promote more than anything because many will stress the cost of living crisis, political division, and social dynamics that are all thrown away, but will still insinuate that the best of people wear designer brands, manipulate parents and children are like to go into thinking that you need to drink out of a Stanley cup, otherwise you're broken goofy. It creates the environment that to be a socially worth noting, you need to spend the money. The fashion in which they don the events in which they frequent, the luxuries in which they merge their identity into, it casts an illusion of intrinsic power, skill, and status. Strip all that away and you see the person in front of you does not have the personality to promote because in truth, one was never there to begin with to the capacity to sell. While all are not like this, the majority are. And while I will not condemn those that buy designer brands, it's your money, do as you wish, I cannot condone the subconscious capitalistic culture of buying your worth as opposed to making it worth. Such as the Kardashians, women who rose to power for their looks, many which they paid to have constructed, and their associations to power is greater than them, Tiger, you are nasty as we have not forgotten about that bullshit. It is also the repeating cycle of making the rich richer and making a platform for the undeserving. And those that may say, Redux, but anyone can be rich. That's the game, you make it yourself. That's the meritocratic foundation of our Western society. I object. That's the ideology of the plutocrats. Those that are within such positions of power lording over the lesser to dictate their worth and ambitions. Those that will retreat into money and therefore influence. Look at your faith as no more than a purchasing asset. And if you've shown these companies and these influences anything, it is that their money can buy your decisions, attention, interest, and even ambitions. So I guess it leads off to the last question. Knowing where the buying power comes from, the people that are platforming these individuals, who is the one that suffers in the totality of this social construction we are directing but simultaneously condemning? The influencers who are there because of the consumers, or is it you? The one giving them an excuse in the first place which gives them reasons for these companies to continue. At the end of the day, accountability goes both ways. While we can go ahead and sit and throw tomatoes at these influences and socialites alike all day long because of their questionable stance in society and how they influence others to make, once again, compulsive spending habits and just bad decisions and they tap into our behavioral mindset of what we should do, what we should look at and what we should buy, we as the consumers all need to realize their worth and money comes from us. We need to start asking the question, what do you do? Why are you here, and why am I putting you here, as opposed to someone else, or having no one there entirely? Either way, only you can ask these questions, but only us as a collective can really decide who deserves to be platformed, and who deserves to be influencers. Back to the shadows I go. 
By the way, follow me on Twitter.